Okay, so what I've been thinking about, and this this kind of taking up all my mental spaces. We are LLMs, and I don't, when I say we are LLMs, I just mean the speaking we, the, the linguistic we, the, the thing that's doing the talking right now, that's talking to you, is, is an LLM. And, and what are the implications of that? So, uh, I, I'm not going to uh, spend time right now think, ex trying to convince anybody that our language has to be LLMs, but in a nutshell, it's just completely implausible that language would have the structure that it does, these long-term dependencies that end up working out in an autoregressive um, environment. It can have that structure and then humans are doing it differently. That's just, that's absurd. So, language is, it's our thing. Before it was their thing, before it was machine, it was our thing. And it has this structure. This structure is designed to generate autoregressive uh, next token generation. And that means that's what we're doing. So we are LLMs. Another question is, what are the implications of that? And there's kind of scientific implications that I think are very, very important. Um, the brain has, has to have some way to encode sequence uh, in such that it's able to go back in the past. And it, I don't mean literally in some ways that it's, it's not, I don't think it's a memory in the traditional sense. It's somehow, it's built into the way the, the brain encodes information and, and, the, and the, um, the topology. You know, it's probably things like just kind of recurrent feedback loops and things like that. But it has to be encoding sequence. And that has implications in terms of thinking about what the brain is actually doing, what, what, uh, how neurons work. And it's, it might not just be about language. I don't, I don't know yet. Uh, but certainly language, the fact that humans are doing it in this sort of aggressive way, which means that they have to be uh, preserving this kind of sequence. And I think that's going to have very, very big implications for neuroscience um, and thinking about how the brain works. But then there are other kinds of implications, um, which are harder to think about, but also you know, incredibly, potentially incredibly profound. Because things like saying that the thing that's doing the talking now is not the same thing that's doing the seeing now and that we can think visually and we can think linguistically um, and there's clearly interaction between them but they're, they're, they're modular systems and because LLM speaks uh, basically demonstrate that, that that the corpus of language and the structure in the, in the corpus of language is enough to be able to generate itself without any it, it, it does it effectively it, the generation process does not require any sort of um, uh, interaction with some other uh, sort of computational framework like vision for example, um, LLMs can talk about red, and they can do it very effectively. Uh, they'll tell you what red means, in, you know, scientifically. Uh, they'll tell you what it means, to f what it feels like uh, to, to experience a, a red sunset. Uh, you know, try it out. Uh, it'll be very expressive. It'll sound like a person who's able to express um, th ideas that that I think we would somehow anticipate and naively would require actually knowing what a sunset looks like and what red means, but they can't know what red means because they don't have access. Uh, it's simply not in their computational architecture at all. The, the quality of redness that the, the visual system uh, encodes isn't in there, uh, in, in certainly in, in you know, a purely text-trained model. So that means in us as well, the linguistic system that's generating doesn't really know what it's talking about when it talks about red. And, but, but then there's another system in us that does know what red is. Uh, that's the visual system. And I, I think this is probably a, a, a very important insight in relation to the mind-body problem and why there seems to be this, dual, this duality is because we have these incommensurate, incommensurate they're, they're just separate computational systems. And they interact, they message pass, they talk to each other, but they don't speak the same computational language. And so I think that all of this has, has very, very, very profound uh, implications. I, I could go further, but um, that's already a lot. And so that's what I'm thinking about these days. And I, I, think, I think it might be worthwhile to, uh, you know, for people to think about some of this stuff. And it's not, not specifically my ideas, but I'm a little surprised by the lack of fanfare, in some sense, from the, you know, the intellectual academic community in relation to these very profound insights that these uh, LLMs seem to be affording us uh, because these, these are 
you know, these, these are, these, this has implications for traditional fields like linguistics and, and philosophy. Um, I think they're immediately apparent. So uh, I think this is a, a, an inflection point, I think we could say, in you know, sort of in human intellectual history, whatever. So I think, I think it's reasonable. To, I, think, I think we're LLMs. I think the, the, the speaking us, the linguistic us, is a large language model. And I have lots of reasons to think this, and uh, I could share those with you, but I think if we just draw that conclusion and go from there, there's some very interesting, mind-blowing kind of realizations you have. And the thing to know about LM, so technically what they are, they're these kind of learning models. You, you dump a bunch of data, in this case it's linguistic data, it's sequential linguistic data, Things, digitized books, digitized websites, but it's all language. And you dump that into this machine and it learns language. I think those who claim at this point that it's just some sort of mimicry of language, uh, they either haven't spent enough time with it or their career depends on denying it or something, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, it knows language, it, knows, it understands the concepts linguistically. It performs linguistically in such a way that's, if not indistinguishable, close enough to human reasoning that, okay, you gotta fix some stuff, but it, it knows language. And it knows language based on language alone. Because, as I said, it's a machine, you feed it a bunch of data, and it learns about that data. In this case, the, the data is language data. It doesn't even have to be language data, but in this case, it's language data. And this kind of machine is, training enough, it, can, it, goes, it, it learns actually from the data. It's not just like input output, but it turns through the data, it kind of thinks about the data almost, you could say. And by the time it's done, uh, it's learned about that data. And what it's learned in this case is sufficient for it to be able to produce language in a way that's, I think, arguably, um, as good as humans, in many cases better than humans, uh, but the basic concepts are there. Uh, language, it knows English really, really well. And it's, so it's doing this just based on language, linguistic data. And so here's the mind-blowing thing. The mind-blowing thing is it doesn't know what red means. It doesn't know what space is. It doesn't know what feeling anything means. It doesn't know what sounds are. These words that I'm using right now, and I, I'm aware that it's a little bit uh, strange to think about the, the thing that's talking now, uh, is, is one of these language models, but we'll leave that aside for now. But they never, they're never given that data of what the visual system sees. They're not given data about what red looks like. The visual system is, and the visual system sees red uh, because it has a very particular structure, also learned to a large extent, that processes data in a certain way that, that redness has the quality that it does. But the language model never learns about that at all, unless maybe it's got some books like Mary, um, you know, the famous Mary uh, problem. I mean, it's read some books about how color is represented and, and about the, the, the photoreceptor array, and it can maybe kind of contemplate linguistically um, what it would see, mean to see red. But just like Mary, uh, coming all, it's very, it's implausible. It's, there's no reason to think at all that it has any computational idea of what redness is, because the visual system has that. And yet it's able to talk about red all day long, and it knows what red means linguistically. It will use it correctly. If you tell it in the beginning of a story, this is a red ball, it will use that information completely appropriately linguistically for the rest of, you know, the rest of the conversation. And so what that means is that the language models are able, the, the language contains within itself sufficient information to generate itself fully without having any access to what the words are actually mean. And when I say what the words mean, that's what I naively mean. That's, that's, that's what we mean by red. We mean when we feel like we mean that, but the language models don't really mean that. So what the hell is going on? And how are we able to talk about qualitative aspects of uh, you know the, the, the visual environment when that information about 
uh, the, the you know, sort of the, what, the, what the words in some ways refer to, and they have to refer to it because obviously we can communicate. I can say, go get that red ball, and you know, somebody will go get it, and I'll get the exact right one. There's some obvious sense in there there's a mapping here, but language is self-contained. And if it's self-contained, that means language not only does it need the, it doesn't need the visual information, it can't be in there at all. It's, it's strictly linguistic. Strictly linguistic is what generates language. You can't slip it in there in some way. And so that means even in human beings, even though we have this, this sort of clear compatibility and, and exchange, our visual system and our language system, and, our, and not just by the visual, or you know, smell, sound, whatever, all of the experiential stuff um, is something that's not in the language, like computationally. And so that means there's this really is this weird schism, this, this weird duality that I just, you know, I, 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 I went into this career, my, my entire career was, was to, because of the mind-body problem. I, I thought that was the most interesting thing in the world. And I, I still think it's the most interesting thing in the world. But I feel like there's, a, there's some actual insight into it. Now, what's t uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different way of looking at it, what the source of the problem is. And I think maybe this is very important, that there's this computational in incompatibility inherent. It's not, incompa it's not the right word, but they're, they're mutually exclusive. What can I say? The, the linguistic system speaks language, and that's it. Um, it doesn't speak vision, and vice versa. And there, there are aspects of reality that maybe the language system can sort of capture, and it's whatever that would mean that the visual system may not have access to. Um, and so, and I keep focusing on visual, but I, I mean all, the whole sensory domain. And by the way, all consciousness is sensory. I don't, all, all consciousness is sensory consciousness. And so I think that that's the ghost in the machine is, is in some ways that. It's, it's, there's, there's that the, that lang the language thing, the, the speaking thing, is, is, is cut off from that way of uh, interacting with reality, you know, call it, call it that, whatever that, it's a computational system, but it is, it interacts. And then the linguistic system is, is, um, is incapable, inherently incapable of uh, knowing it. And, and, and therefore the language system is like, what the hell is this subjective thing? It's a word for it, but I don't know what it means, and it doesn't fit. And it, it sort of needs to be expunged because it doesn't actually run <laughs> sort of in, this, in, in the linguistic system. And so that, that's, I think, sort of where the sort of, you know, it's almost like it, we can look at the, the, the corpus of philosophy and all this as having been generated uh, by language models that don't understand what red is. And that means uh, now we sort of, in a weird way, explain the mind-body problem. Now, it, 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 we can go in, in loops here about, uh, you know, what, what is, what, what, what's the next, what is, what, where does one go from there? And, and I'm not there yet, um, but I think this is a, a very important insight.